That's three moderators. Uh, so as you know, my name is Mark Lepresti, uh, and I have the pleasure of uh, moderating this panel of uh, distinguished uh, industry experts that are going to continue this very stimulating discussion that we started this morning that is intended to continue the process of empowering you as individual investors to make smart decisions and better choices when allocating capital to the cannabis industry. Um, I want to thank uh, Kim and The Money Show and uh, Jordan and Charlie uh, for having us here. Uh, and of course, to uh, my friend and, and co-host, uh, John Nigerian. Uh, so joining me uh, on this panel is uh, Brian Hayek. Brian is the president of Driven Deliveries. You can guess what they do in the industry. Um, Driven is the only publicly traded cannabis delivery service operating in the United States, providing on-demand marijuana delivery in select cities as permitted by law. We can talk about that. Um, we also have Craig Fox. Craig is the CEO of High Times. Uh, High Times is probably the oldest brand in the space. Um, and Craig, in his more than 25-year uh, career in the media industry, has been a founder, director, and operator of some of the most prominent entertainment and media companies, some uh, household names such as uh, Live Nation, uh, Core Media, and Elvis Presley Enterprises. Uh, and then finally is Anthony Dutton. Anthony is joining us again from his panel uh, this morning. Anthony, uh, as you know, is a co-founder of Kenex, uh, has taken uh, several companies public successfully in, in Canada, uh, and has over 25 years of experience in the public markets and raising capital for emerging growth companies. And so the topic of this panel is identifying emerging business opportunities. And the industry has changed dramatically from when I first got involved, call it seven or eight years ago. Um, and I'd like to maybe start, uh, Anthony, perhaps with you. Um, where do you see the next big thing in the industry? Wow. <laughs> I see what I call normalization of a lot of the expectations around the industry. I think a lot of people have got a little ahead of their skis, to be quite frank with you, and cannabis has uh, been around for... Yeah. Better? Yes. You can hear me okay now? How's that? Okay. Yeah, I think it's going to be a bit of a resetting of expectations, to be quite honest with you. Um, you know, cannabis has been around for hundreds of years. It's been only in the mainstream, however, for the last few years. And I think that uh, we've been seeing, and I'm sure you guys have as well. I mean, when I say we, we as a company are getting shown opportunities all the time, which are really not grounded in any kind of sense of reality as to what cannabis is really ultimately going to be about, which is, in my opinion, it's going to be a consumer branded good with a focus on recreation, with a focus on nutraceutical, and then yet to emerge, we haven't seen this yet because there hasn't been enough peer-reviewed research, but there's going to be a pure pharma medical play. And that's kind of in the works, but it's going to take some time. I've been quite interested, just at this conference as a matter of fact, how many MDs have come by our booth and uh, want to you know, just you know, pick our brains about the medical applications. And I think, to be quite honest, there are hundreds of potential medical applications, but there's no um, significant body of peer-reviewed research yet around that, around that. So that's probably the next market that's going to open up. And then generally, I think we're just going to see a normalizing of what I call expectations around the industry. And, and by normalizing, meaning these businesses sort of coming into their own and maturity as mm -hmm. being more operationally sophisticated? Yes, and I, and I think that also investors are going to have to have a bit of a reset around you know, how they think about value. Uh, you can't have a company that's doing $5 million a year in revenue uh, worth you know, $15 billion, and it's not sustainable. Um, and you have to also look at very closely how these companies are supporting themselves. And I think you said earlier, you know, it's the allocation of capital, and that is kind of the key element of any successful business is how do you allocate capital and how do you, how do you manage that capital allocation. And so when you've got companies that are getting investors throwing money at them, they can live off their balance sheet for as long as investors continue to throw money at them. But one day there's going to be a day of reckoning. And uh, if you can't support yourself, then that's going to be a bit of a problem. 
Uh, that's an interesting point, but I would argue that the unicorn boom that Silicon Valley has been perpetuating has made cannabis not unique to that valuation problem. Uh, I would when agree. You have companies like Uber and Lyft going public and then subsequently being punished by the market. I think it took about eight hours before the first class action lawsuit was filed after Lyft's <laughs> IPO not too long ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't want to steal my friend John Stunder talking about the opportunities and maybe going short some of those securities. Um, but perhaps maybe, um, Craig, so you're an industry veteran in the media space. Um, where do you see the need for sort of an institutionalization of the companies that are emerging in the cannabis space? Brands. I mean, I think what Anthony said is spot on. Um, there's a lot of people that are growing. There's a lot of people that are selling. There's a lot of people that are distributing. But um, today, there are not a lot of brands. And fundamentally, there's a few things that typically drive every industry. Um, one of them is brands. I talked about it in my speech the other morning. I think virtually everybody in this room goes to their local pharmacy, and they know full well that they could buy the same over-the-counter drug that's got a generic name on it, but they still reach for Advil or Relieve or Excedrin for a reason, and that's brands and that's marketing. You know full well it's the same exact active product. It doesn't treat you any differently, but you pay a premium for brands, and that's what this industry is going to see going forward. I think that's part of the growth that's coming. I think there's pharmaceutical as well. There's a lot of things that are coming, but if you were to ask me directly, it's, it's, I, I believe it's one of the reasons I took the position because I believe that High Times is the biggest brand in the space. So obviously it's somewhat self-serving, but I do fundamentally believe that every industry needs brands. That's what is, drives our entire economy. That's what drives all the entertainment that we watch. That's what gives you the ability to watch NFL football. That's what drives virtually everything we do every day is brands. We choose our airlines. We choose our clothing. We choose our food. We choose our medicine. We choose our water by brands. Think about that. You're paying for water because it has a name on it. You could turn on your faucet like you did 25 years ago. It's the same water. But, well, you're, but you're paying for a brand. I, I, I'd argue that the water in New York City is better than it is in Nevada, but that's just a debate for another part of the day. Um, so, uh, Brian, I, I would argue that, that while Craig made some excellent points and branding and marketing are essential to the development of the industry, that there are probably some significant roadblocks along the way to achieving that sort of widespread branding and notoriety. And, and in my mind, the biggest uh, roadblock, or, or speed bump, or whatever you want to call it, is standardization. So I know when I buy a bottle of Poland Spring, or a bottle of Tylenol, uh, or a Tyson chicken, that it's going to taste the same as it did the last time I bought one of those brands. And unless you can bring standardization and normalization, and giving consumers the peace of mind to know that they're going to get the same product on Friday, on Thursday, on Saturday, or a month from now, um, it's going to be difficult to achieve that kind of branding. Would, would you not agree with that, Brian? I would agree. So one of the things that we talk about all the time is, is consistency. And when you look at, say, McDonald's, like why is McDonald's the largest hamburger chain in the world? It's not because it's the best burger or the best it's anything. It's because it's consistent. It's over and over. You know the experience that you're going to get every time that you walk in there. And I think this goes back to straight with the branding discussion is that a brand provides you consistency. When you open up that bottle of Tylenol, you know it's going to have the shrink wrap feel on it. You know that it's safe, that you know it's there. When you open up that bottle of water, you know that it's going to taste a certain way. It's going to have the same mineral content. And it's going to feel the same way. And so I think when you, when you look at this industry and you bring it out of the, the black market and into the open, that's really one of the things that's missing and that a lot of us are trying to build is a, is a consistent user and consumer experience. Okay. So again, part of the purpose of this panel is to help you all identify emerging trends and of course investment opportunities in the space. Um, Anthony, is there anybody out there that you're aware of that is addressing directly the, the, the issue of normalization and standardization of product? To be quite frank with you, uh, not as much as I would like. You would have bought them already if, yeah. you, if you had, probably. Um, and, and I think that the way that we think about it is from the bottom up rather than the top down. So when I, what I mean by that is that we look at the operational skill sets that are required to deliver that consistent experience. And so we're heavily into automation. We use a lot of, uh, as I say, automated equipment. We're going to be using more so as we expand the company. And uh, that's allowed us to deliver a consistent you know, ex taste experience. So for example, our edibles, that 
some of you may have had already, are, are manufactured in a pretty large industrial kitchen in Seattle um, by a guy who used to run a 300-person uh, confectionery catering business in Sacramento. So you have to bring that kind of, uh, of scale, that kind of uh, what I call enterprise management thinking. Mm -hmm. A lot of the problems that we see in terms of delivering a standard experience kind of, funnily enough, go back to access to capital. Because, you know, if you are a very good batch maker of whatever, um, you, you, you can't, you can't uh, sort of expand that skill set to making a million units a month until you have, you know, money to buy an $8 million machine. Right. So it's, it's kind of, uh, you know, the cart before the horse issue. So luckily, given that we are very well, well capitalized and we've had a lot of that equipment, you know, installed before we actually bought the company in Washington, that's given us a bit of a head start in that, in that regard. Craig, do we need the government to be involved in the standardization, normalization process, or is, or is industry going to do it? Wow. <laughs> Okay, it's been nice uh, meeting all of Thanks you. Thanks for coming. <laughs> no, I, I, I just, Good answer. Do, do Good we answer. need the government involved in, in standardizing cannabis? Probably not. That's probably the last thing we need. Um, we don't need the government involved in distribution of cannabis. They're not involved in the distribution of most other industries, maybe alcohol. There's no reason. What we do need is standardization. What we do need is standardized brands. We do need is trade credit. We do need standardized distribution, but the government doesn't need to be involved. The, government, the, the industry will figure it out. Those that are successful, those that put out a good product, those that put out a consistent product will be here tomorrow and the next day and the next day, and those that don't simply won't. Will it not require some agreement among industry participants as to what that common uh, quality control or standardization will be? I, th I think those are, that's a different question. Quality control and consumer safety, I think, are important. I think that the government does do a good job to make sure the products we eat are safe for us, sure. that they don't have poisons, that the packaging doesn't hurt us. But beyond that, what's, what is that product? They don't need to weigh in on a cookie. They don't need to weigh in on a candy bar. They don't need to weigh in on a cannabis edible. Coming from the, uh, the wireless industry, if you look at the evolution between 3G, 4G, and 5G, it was really the industry that came together and set what the standard was going to be. And I think a lot of the, the assumptions we have is that we're at the very edge of that right now and we'll, we'll all be working together because at the end of the day, it, it helps us with economics and scale to have that standardization. Anthony, with standardization, does it bring uh, a, a risk or a down or a negative side of commoditization? I mean, I agree with both these guys here that I think the industry is best positioned to to sort of essentially regulate itself for its own self-preservation. I mean, I think we need probably government oversight to make sure that people aren't using heavy metals and pesticides when they shouldn't be. But uh, in terms of the industry, we have a vested interest as industry participants in making sure that the product that we sell is popular and safe. Because if we didn't do that, then we would be doing not only ourselves a disservice, but the whole industry. So, you know, a case in point that we dealt with in, 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 in Washington is childproof packaging. So the childproof packaging that some of you I've seen struggle with, eating the candies at our booth, which are quite difficult to open. <laughs> um, um, you know, that was really a, a, a standard laid down by the industry because we as sellers of this product didn't want to have kids finding these chocolates and opening up and getting, getting sick. So, you know, I think that it was important that the industry, or rather the government said, you need to have childproof packaging, and then the industry figures out what that childproof packaging is. In terms of commoditization, there's always going to be commoditization in, in any industry, and you're going to have premium products, you're going to have commodity products. This is, you know, it's a fact of life. Um, so, you know, where we see ourselves as a company is, is not in the commodity end of things, um, but ultimately that will, that will exist. So brand identity, quality control, superior product, key elements of investing in successful cannabis companies. Mm -hmm. Can, um, Craig, maybe you can speak to the issue of product and service, or excuse me, service availability to participants in the cannabis industry, specifically around access to banking and some of the typical things that businesses need to succeed. Um, yeah. How have you seen that evolve over the past couple of years? And, and maybe more uh, precisely, uh, at what point do you think, at least in the United States, that uh, that community will, will catch up with the needs of the cannabis industry? I mean, I, I, can't, I can't predict how, how, how fast um, the House and the Senate will move, you know, politics are for, poli are for politicians. Um, but clearly, as this, industry as this industry grows, 
There's money to be made by banking. There's money to be made by taxes. The states, there's 33 states where there's some form of legalization. They don't want to be accepting cash. The federal government used to charge you a premium to accept cash. The federal government wants, to pay, wants our tax money, but they don't want cash. They want an electronic transfer. So it will come. The question is when it will come. I can't give you an answer to that. But when it does, you're going to see explosive growth. I mean, this industry is growing already. But when banking gets regulated and we can all, what well, we actually can, but when people who touch the plant can actually deposit and go to a bank and have credit card services, the growth is going to be extraordinary. The inability right now for retailers or for delivery companies to be able to accept credit cards is hampering the business. People want this to be a rationalized business like everything else. The genie's out of the bag. It's not going backwards. This is a product that people use for a lot of different reasons. People use it to sleep. People use it for recreation purposes. People use it instead of over-the-counter drugs. And once the government starts to recognize that it doesn't have the stigma that they created, um, banking will come. We'll all be able to access the credit markets. Mm -hmm. We'll all be able to access trade credit. In other words, um, right now, in the, because we don't have access to banks, because the cannabis industry doesn't have access to banks, we don't have access to traditional credit lines. Um, so trade credit is basically, maybe you take a check. That's about it. That will change, and with that will become growth for everybody. And uh, Brian, maybe you can comment. Do, do you see opportunity there? And, and maybe a, a more specific question, who's going to win that race? Is it the industry incumbents in banking and finance, or are there up-and-comers that have uh, sort of made a, a dedicated effort to try to provide these services to the cannabis industry as regulation catches up? So we use a lot of different uh, kind of dedicated services for the, um, for the cannabis industry that are able to support us with either banking or credit facilities, stuff like that. Uh, but at the end of the day, it goes back to the scale and, and standardization. And I, I know me personally and, and our company is really excited for the day when you can bank through Chase or Bank of America or any of those and have all of the scale and the support and the infrastructure from everything that they provide. So. Um, I think it goes back to that there's, there's some niche players right now um, there, but when, when the floodgates open, it's, it's like anything else, the, the strong will survive. And the expectation for at least on our end is that the bigger ones will, will win that kind of race. Anthony, I assume you'd agree? Yeah, I mean, I, I am a niche player, you know, as a Canadian in an American market. And the reason that Canadian public companies exist is simply because U.S. companies cannot list in the U.S. Right. And so I'm kind of of two minds about this. I mean, I love having this advantage over my American cousins. It's kind of fun. Um, but I'm also realistic, and I know that, you know, eventually the time will come when Goldman Sachs and others are going to be banking this industry, and us Canadians are going to be, you know, left out in the cold, to be quite frank. And the same goes with commercial banking in the U.S. You know, the, the biggest advocates for providing commercial banking facilities to the industry in the U.S. are the large U.S. commercial banks. They want to do it. This is a $50 billion industry. They're not banking. So we have kind of a bit of a mishmash of ways that we do it. We deal with credit unions that are regulated by the state, for example, as opposed to federal regulation. So, you know, ultimately the market will prevail. I'm a big believer in the free market. And, um, you know, I, I hope that, uh, you know, there'll be long enough time that I, as a Canadian, can still take advantage of the situation. But ultimately I expect that, you know, the Americans will pass the States Act and there'll be American banks participating. Would you agree, Craig? Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, that's that's that that's. I mean, I think the Canadian. I think there's some great Canadian companies. So. I'll, I'll still come here on holiday. Just still come here on holiday. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think, um, and we can get really technical. But there's there's tax issues with respect to the cannabis space that are unique to the cannabis space. Um, there's lack of trade credit. There's inability to borrow money. There's inability to take credit cards on a regular basis. All of that will get resolved. I don't know when, obviously, but it will get resolved. And when it does. Um, the whole industry, the whole industry will rise. Some will succeed, maybe the bigger players, but certainly the whole industry will take advantage of that. The, the credit markets is super interesting, and just to jump in here, we, we we've seen this sort of happen over the last six months. Um, Forefront, the company that we're buying, just secured a fifty million dollar secured line of credit last week at what I call reasonable terms. You know, if we had tried to access the debt markets a year ago, we would be paying you know eighteen to twenty five points, because that's what the lenders could get. But now. You know, the industry is big enough that uh, there are cash flows, there's assets, the lenders don't have as much leverage as they used to, and it's fantastic for us because we can now, you know, access, you know, debt capital, growth capital without having to issue shares every time we need to raise money. And are you doing that 
through traditional lending sources or non-bank hedge these, fund these, these types? Are, these are sort of what I would call traditional lenders not through non-banks. It's usually syndicates of high net worth individuals. In this case, it was like 10 guys, and they threw $5 million each into an LP, and we borrowed money from them. So it just as an alternative to equity financing from right. uh, and, private and capital sources. An alternative sources. to, to you know, traditional debt financing that you would right. get from a bank. Right, right. I mean, I'm sure Chase would love to lend us money. They're yeah, very they, bankable, but they're just not allowed to do yeah, it. They can't at the moment, unfortunately. Um, Brian, coming back to the importance of branding and identity, can you speak a little bit to uh, Driven's branding strategy? So we kind of took the, the strategy of ours. If you notice, like our color, and there's nothing about it that, that screams cannabis um, because we're here to support our, our brand partners. So we view us as kind of a logistics partner. We work in the backside, um, and we're very much uh, supporting the brands that are front-facing. Um, additionally, we wanted to be able to move in and out of different industries really quickly, um, as especially as logistics kind of last mile delivery provider. Um, and so we didn't have like the, the stark contrast of green or the marijuana leaf or stuff like that. So we took a very different route, um, but then we have our brand partners and then the acquisition partners that we do have that are uh, one of our acquisitions that we've announced is a ganja runner. I mean, it literally has the name drug in its name. Um, so it's just kind of a, a conglomerate that we're putting together in terms of different uh, branding pieces. But uh, our focus is on logistics, our focus is on deliveries, and we really focused on that. And the chat, the media channels that you're using, are you, are you using more uh, digital and social media as opposed to traditional advertising and marketing? And how do you sort of see that play oh, out in the industry? A lot of the normal uh, marketing channels are just not available to us. If you look at, especially the newer stuff in terms of like Facebook ads, Instagram, that highly targeted, um, even Google, they've loosened up a little bit, but those just aren't available to us. So a lot of it is is going back to either print ads and in high times and stuff like that and in industry publications um, or otherwise. So. I would say is that as the liberalization continues is that you're gonna see a growth of brands really being able to show their, their brand identity and, and brand products and, um, and we'll be a part of that as well. And do you see the digital sort of becoming as prevalent in the industry as it is across other industries and sectors? Absolutely, so one of the things is because we actually deliver the product to the consumer. Um, we capture their name, address, age, gender. So a lot of uh, very highly targetable information that can be used later on to retarget um, or to, to kind of feed back into those algorithms that Facebook has created and everything else. So we, we view that as a kind of a pillar and one of the, um, the big pieces of our company is that data. And that actually is a great segue. Um, Craig or Anthony, uh, data. Uh, how important is alternative data to the cannabis industry and how do you see it um, impacting and improving how these companies operate over time? And, and is there anybody focused on that in the space? Well, I, I think data is important in every industry, to be honest with you. And you know, we are very data driven, so we monitor all of our SKUs, we monitor everything that we can possibly monitor to allow us to make better decisions around the allocation of capital and the management of capital. I kind of go on and on about that, but that is, you know, kind of really what successful businesses do. Um, so, you know, in, in our case, you know, we, we generate a lot of our in, da data internally. There are some data providers, third party, that will, you know, provide statistics on on visits to stores, average spend, all kinds of different things. So the more data we have, obviously, the better. At the same time, you got to be careful you don't fall into what I call analysis paralysis and you just kind of go around in circles looking at data without making any decisions. And I've seen that happen before as well. But, you know, industry today is very much tied to data sets. That's just kind of a fact of life. And so we are, um, I think, blessed with having quite a lot of data, but there's always going to be more needed. And I think to the point that both my fellows up here have shared is that because of a lot of the traditional channels where data can typically be harvested, you know, through the Facebooks and the Googles and others, you know, we, we, we still don't have as much data as we would like. Um, but that's, that's coming. And to the extent that it becomes available, we'll obviously access it. But there's, there is a unique thing about the cannabis space with respect to data. While, while the cannabis space doesn't have the access to some of the social media data that traditional businesses have, because almost every state has what they call seed to sale laws, which means you literally track a seed, a cannabis seed, until it lends, until it turns into a product and you buy it in a dispensary. There's no other industry on the face of the earth 
where you have access to exactly what's being sold, exactly what's being sold to consumers. It's really unique. It's a huge opportunity for cannabis. It's, it's accessible to everyone. It's owned by the government databases. But um, the cannabis companies have an ability, and I, I agree with you know, data paralysis, but you have the ability to see exactly what's selling and the ability to make changes and maneuvers in real time. There's not another industry that has that. And was that developed as a function of uh, quality control and safety? No, it's because they're fucking scared. <laughs> it's because they created, it's because the government created this stigma and this fear of cannabis, a plant that's existed for thousands of years, and they don't know how to regulate it. They're afraid of where it's going to go and what to do with it. They're begrudgingly moving forward. It's all going to change and all going to go away, but that's the only reason. And then they mess it up, because we had a system in Washington which worked really well, and then the government thought they would tweak it to make it better, and the whole thing cratered, There's and it was terrible. There's only one other consumer industry, huge industry, that has this kind of data tracking. It's plutonium, because we all go buy plutonium all the time. Uh, I know that this audience probably has lots of questions for the panel, so in the time we have remaining, um, you. with your permission. Fire away. Sure. I think, I think everyone up here is involved in some lobbying efforts or another, whether at state levels or whether at the federal level. We're all involved in trying to move this, move this forward. High Times has been around for 45 years, so we are the granddaddy of standing up for this cause. Sir? In my experience, there is actually quite a lack of what I call peer-reviewed research, and part of that is because uh, a lot of academic institutions have been reluctant to accept federal funding, or rather cannabis funding, because it jeopardizes their other sources of funding for completely unrelated initiatives. However, that, that is turning and turning quite quickly. So all of these initiatives, like a library of all CBD strains, for example, and you know the genetic markers around the different kinds of cannabis plants and the cannabinoids, is, is, is a work in progress, and it's getting better and better every year. But there's a lot of work to be done there. Because I'm here to subtly sell you on High Times, come to hightimes.com, and you can learn all about cannabis. <laughs> <laughs> so you've already forgotten. <laughs> sure. Are there sure. any ETFs out there that are investing primarily in the cannabis industry at this time? That's a John there, question. There are two, right, John? <laughs> That's a John yeah, question. There are two. One is uh, uh, MJ, which is already up over a billion three in assets. Um, that's the biggest. Um, was that MJ? MJ, like marijuana, uh, MJ. MJ. <laughs> and the other one is... Mary Jane? Mary Jane. <laughs> that's the it. Other, the other one is uh, YOLO, Y-O-L-O, -O, like you only live once. Uh, YOLO. Um, and that, despite the fact that I think very little of them, and they have done a horrible job marketing it. But they exist. I, and I'm <laughs> but they come exist. Front and say that. There's still almost 70 million under management in what a week or 10 days. We are launching one any day. Is our, our my brother Pete and I have one before the SEC. It has been there before the government shutdown, and we're waiting for approval any day. Ours will be different. It trades under the symbol THCX when it trades on the New York Stock Exchange, and that is a 40 stock fund. So again, the reason, as you guys know that you would do a, an ETF, for instance, instead of just a single investment or two or three investments, is that right church, wrong pew, we call it. So you go into the right church, but you sit in the wrong pew, and you get the bad performance instead of the good performance. Um, the uh, MJ, for instance, which is also about a 40 stock fund, I think, um, they rebalance quarterly, and they're up, I think, 40, 3% year to date, something like that, obviously phenomenal performance. Um, ours is going to rebalance monthly. And so when we finally do catch what all of these three, what Brian and Craig and Anthony, Anthony were talking about as far as when the banking or when the, it becomes approved that you can go across the United States, there will be such a gold rush for that 
And we're hoping, of course, that it happens um, when the other guys are just one month in with theirs, since they rebalance every three months quarterly. They won't be able to change theirs by their own uh, uh, mandate. They have a quarterly rebalancing, whereas we rebalance monthly. Another question? So it's THCX that'll be when it gets approved. Sir? Should I ask, um, do you think dispensary can be a life, uh, franchise model like restaurant? I, I fundamentally believe yes. I mean, I, I think it's legal now. I think the jury may be out, but yeah, there's no question. The, the difficulty in franchising, if you want to get a little technical about it, is what we talked about earlier. It's the inability to have consistent product across state lines. And the concept of a franchise, you go to McDonald's anywhere in the world, it's because they're buying the same burger, they're buying the same sauces, they're buying the same ingredients from the same supplier no matter where they are. So you know whether you're in Moscow or New York City or Las Vegas, your McDonald's hamburger is going to taste, taste the same. Right now in cannabis, since you cannot move your product across state line, it's a little more difficult to get consistent product, particularly in flour and in, in what we consider pot. Um, but in edibles, like Anthony makes, because he's using um, basically just basic THC, he could replicate, replicate his formula anywhere. But there's just not enough products right now to have a full franchise model. But it's absolutely coming. But within the same state, can they do the franchise model? Yes. yes. Nobody's done that yet. Nobody, nobody's done that yet. And one of the, one of the things one of, that interests me about High Times, again, I'm going to pitch you, um, is that we're a 45-year-old company that's never been used on dispensaries simply because they were never legal. We believe that companies are going to want to diversify and stand out. And that's what we believe is one of the benefits of High Times. We do believe that going forward, you're going to see on a global basis High Times dispensaries and, and consumption lounges and maybe even physical product. I'm not convinced, however, that uh, long-term dispensaries are going to be viable businesses um, because, you know, we're already seeing it in Canada where you're getting product distributed in what's called Shoppers Drug Mart, which is the equivalent of Walgreens. So I think the dispensary model is going to evolve to be... I, th I think the dispensary model will evolve to be one like what I, ca I, ca I call it the Nike model. So, you know, Nike have, you know, dis dispensaries, they have stores in high traffic areas where lots of people walk by and you go in there and you kind of learn about Nike and you meet a product manager or a product person, but you can buy your Nikes anywhere. And so I think once people know what they want um, in terms of whether it's an edible or a tincture or a cream and they know they can get it at any other store, then why would they go to, you know, a dispensary? It's reason why beer companies and wine companies don't own their own, you know, retail outlets except for a few very exclusive ones. On a short-term basis, a necessary evil, but long-term, not so sustainable. Uh, I, I don't think yeah. so. Interesting. Sir? Question. Uh, the revenue model for medical and recreational looks good. I haven't heard anything about industrial hemp, <coughs> concrete, textiles, all of the things that hemp in the industrial space can bring in mass millions, if not billions. Mm. What's your viewpoint on the industrial hemp space? Uh, I've, I don't really have one, to be I, honest I, with you. I don't yeah. think any of us did. We're here to talk about weed. <laughs> <laughs> Ma'am? But, but, yeah, it's in the vertical, so couldn't you, couldn't, couldn't you say that it's like all, it's like the same industry, you know, the cannabis industry would include hemp, creeds, and whatnot, mm. bioplastics. No, I mean, you're, this is I mean, you're talking you're, about construction versus consumer-facing retail products in different, completely different industries. I mean, today's hemp is not George Washington's hemp. Let's leave it at that. There are a thousand more than that different uses for the hemp plant. Um, the nice thing is it's a much more environmentally sound product to be using, and I think you're going to see a tremendous development in that part of the business. I just don't think anyone up here has the expertise. It's not what we do for a living, so we don't really have the expertise to talk about But it. I think also when people talk about hemp and CBD, they're often thinking about kind of the, the what I call the cultivation or the agricultural side of it. As far as I'm concerned, if I didn't have to grow any weed, I wouldn't. But the only reason we grow weed is so that we have the product to run through our extractions to turn it into edible products. And I think that, you know, the analogy that I always give is that nobody knows and nobody even cares where the tomatoes come from in their Heinz ketchup. They just like Heinz ketchup. So ultimately, apart from, you know, a very few boutique cultivators uh, who grow very, very high quality, you know, cannabis for the cannabis connoisseur, the people who spend 100 or $200 on a bottle of wine, for example, and have the same kind of nose for fine cannabis, for the most part, we're going to see the cultivation of this uh, commodity, which is what it will devolve into, uh, migrate to low-cost labor jurisdiction 
jurisdictions that may even be overseas. And we're already seeing that happening. You know, there's been licenses issued in the last six months in Colombia, Peru, Ecuador, Lesotho, Zimbabwe, Uganda, Kenya, um, India, Sri Lanka, Thailand. All of those countries are just going to grow cannabis. They're going to extract it on site into crude oil and they're going to ship it to wherever the end market is. And those end producers like us are going to refine it down into whatever the whatever the, the specific chemistry is that is going to go into either a, a patch or a tincture or an edible or a vape. And all of those are kind of slightly different. So I think that's where the market's ultimately going and that's why they don't grow tea in Canada. So that, that would imply that the, the long-term outcome for the, for the grow model is, is fraught with a little bit of danger. Well, it, it, it assumes, of course, the free trade of the commodity around the world. Right, right now, people are captured by the state lines and, and national lines, right? So if you want to sell a cannabis product in California, you've got to grow the weed in California. Right, right. But if but you could buy it for a third of the price from Columbia, why wouldn't you? Yeah. Right, I mean, I think, that, I think that the ingredients model will change, right? That's all we're saying. Right. I, 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 some of the people that are doing it now are going to be some of the people that do it for the next 25 or 50 years. Some of the people that are doing it now won't, and, but their businesses may evolve into something else. Right. There's a lot of people that are growing cannabis currently, like Anthony said. He's doing it out of necessity. It's not something he wants to do. But as it becomes a commodity, as he has access mm. to that THC, in a more efficient way, and it's all coming, that's where he'd rather buy it. But a lot of runway between here and there. A lot of runway, yeah, a lot of a lot opportunity. Of this is right. a growth industry, obviously. I, I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Sir? Question. We're going to uh, go to Ryan here. Congratulations on coming to my state, Nevada. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, we just announced so, that today. Yeah, my question is, though, can you guys compete with Lyft and Uber and all this in California? We know that a lot of a lot of percentage I mean, you cover the LA area, San Diego, the whole area. But but when they go do their thing, which they're going to do sooner or later, are you guys going to be that far ahead? Are we going to? I'm sure. Are we going to be that far ahead uh, of the I, game? You know. I would say is that. When you look at how the cannabis space is developing right now, getting around and working within the government regulations is, is extremely difficult. And you look at somebody like Uber, Lyft, Amazon, Walmart, wanting to kind of get into the game right now, it just doesn't make sense for their brand identity, it doesn't make sense for the logistics infrastructure, it doesn't make sense for the banking. When, as those things change, our goal is to make sure that we're, we're big enough and we're, we're uh, fast enough movers that we can compete when they come in. And so I, I would also say is that uh, consolidation will be coming. And I think that's, that's the expectation is that at some point um, we'll, we'll be acquired or we'll start acquiring in one way or the other. All right. Um, I want to thank our terrific panel for helping. Thank you to the audience. It's been terrific.